Welcome to Ghost Likes channel. At the moment, we are still doing some tweaking of the back end to lighten up the compilation. So this video will be running the bleeding version of Spiral in the VS Code extension host. We'll be improving the language as we go through the series. Let's do a simple compilation to show what has changed since last time. A bunch of default includes have been removed compared to the C backend, and the templatized array struct has been added. If you study it for a bit, you'll see that one of the template parameters is an int, and this is in fact the size parameter that we will be using for our statically sized arrays. We are going to start work on the new core library that will make use of these types. We'll build it up video by video. For now, let's get the basics out of the way so we can move on to making games. If you look at the screen, you'll see that the spiral project file has its own editor support, and you'll get type errors for non-existent files and directories. You can click on them and then use a code action to create them should you want to. What we will do here is create a directory called core HLS, and inside of it, we will start by creating the base file. That dash at the end in the project file, the one you see on the right side of core, for example, tells the compile to inline all the functions and type definitions in the module into the parent one. It could also be thought as an auto-open, but compared to F-sharp or Python modules, for example, Spiral can only have functions and type definitions at the top level, so its modules are free of side effects. If you look at the base module, you'll see that it is kind of a mess due to there being Python-specific objects. There are even references to the Cython backend that Spiral once had. As we are working on a HLS backend specific core library, we'll get rid of all of those. Before we move on to work on the array library, let's take a look at the other files. Actually, before we do that, let's first create the static array type. It isn't in the documentation just yet, but those at signs are splicing type literals specifically into a macro. The limits file only has the numerical limits for various types. We'll bring that one into the HLS core. The real core file has the wrappers for the inbuilt operations. But in addition to that, it also has the structure equality and comparison functions for every type in the language apart from functions. It also has structural hashing. We'll leave dealing with that for later. We'll probably need it if we try implementing tabular algorithms on the FPGA. It wouldn't be hard to port it, we just have to decide how we are going to hash floats, for example, or whether we want to do 32 or 64-bit hashing. We recommend checking out the equality functions in the real core if you want to see a practical example of the bottom-up style of programming in Spiral that other languages are too weak to support. Now, these loop functions are something we need to work on. The ones in the regular core library are using heap-allocated mutable references for keeping track of state, as well as the iteration counts. We have to get rid of those. But as to what we could replace them, that gave us some trouble. At first, we thought that we could just mutate the runtime variables as is, after dining them to move the literals to the runtime stage, but realized that this would cause a lot of trouble because spiral variables are supposed to be immutable, and violating that assumption could lead to a lot of bugs. So to ensure that the variables being mutated in the loop aren't being shared, we just push them through a macro, thereby ensuring that new runtime variables are created specifically in this for loop. We can then mutate those safely. Having to do it like this is just an unfortunate consequence of Spiral not having F-sharps let mutable statements and being a polyglot language targeting multiple other ones. Doing the loop like this is completely fine, as just setting one variable to another without doing any computations will be optimized away in the C++ backend. Unfortunately, while we might have had the right goal with the use of macros, using them like this would mess up the types and we'll have to go back and fix this later. And the same goes for setting the state. But at this moment in time, we weren't aware of it. Right now, we are looking at the original library and thinking and trying to decide what we should bring into the new one. We are figuring it out as we go along. It feels like we are taking on too much work. What we will do is kick out all those filters from the array library. Maps and folds are fine, as the arrays for them can easily be statically allocated, but filters require dynamically sized arrays, and they are a poor fit for FPGAs. A bit earlier, we also suggested tabular RL and hashing on the FPGA, but we should also get rid of that it would be quite difficult to implement a dictionary needed for those without dynamic memory allocation. 
On the FPGA, we simply have better options to choose from when it comes to ML models, starting with linear ones and moving on to neural nets. Neural nets are just a sequence of maps and folds, with some matrix multiplies thrown in between. They are a very good fit for the FPGA programming model, but it remains to be seen whether the devices themselves will be up to task. We think this aspect is what is interesting about this series. If we thought we'd just be able to make superhuman poker agents and rock the online gambling dens, we'd just do it and not bother making videos chronicling the journey. Why bother YouTubing when you could just make millions of dollars being a Chad Raider instead? We'll probably run into various issues preventing us from getting what we want, like when in the past we relied on GPUs. What we are most afraid of are the rumored FPGA compile times that can last hours and days. But we are also having issues getting response from the one cloud provider actually offering the deep learning focused Versal cards and aren't sure whether the old F1 AWS instances will be enough for what we want to do. Maybe it will turn out that the HLS tooling is fine with C++ simulations, but has quirks preventing the models from running properly. There are all kinds of things that can go wrong in this series, but the FPGA programming model is very interesting, and that is what attracted us to this field. The chance of us winning isn't zero, so for that reason, we should just keep going. On the screen, now we have woken up to the problem with using macros haphazardly and are factoring them into functions in order to keep the flow of type inference going. The language is inferring far too generic types, and those need to be fixed. It would also be good to factor out the macro inside the body that is assigning to state, and we will do that once we check out the IDER functions and realize that they are not typed properly. Here, the map function should be mapping the types from A to B, not from A to A. Compared to the old version of the array library, the new one is propagating the sizes at compile time through the system as type literals, so the init function, for example, doesn't take in the size as an argument. Instead, the type system propagates the size into it through the forals, which in the top-down segment are applied automatically. Since we don't have dependent types in the top-down segment of spiral, there is a bit of awkwardness in the conversion of type literals to literals. Since we can't do it directly, we had to define that static array dim type at the start of the HLS core library. And yes, if you wanted to change it, you'd need to go into the core library and modify it directly. This is one of the problems with Spiral not having a more refined module system like the standard ML language does. Though, rather than take a month or three to radically change the language, we might at the very top level add some support for specifying compile time constants and solve the problem that way instead. We'll do that when the need becomes pressing. For now, let's not get distracted by the thoughts of that and push forward. We'll move on to testing. We implemented the loops, then implemented the maps, and now we'll finally try them out. As we said, we are still tweaking the language, and after this video is over, we will add the default literal functionality to the parser so you don't have to keep writing 5i32 at the type level and can simply write 5. Using 64-bit integers wouldn't be correct here and would run into issues when getting the length, for example. We'll just do an init, a few maps, and an eater to print out all the values like in the previous video. But the difference between now and then is that we have the static array type and reusable generic kernels operating on arrays. We have a small problem at the moment due to those empty assignment statements being generated. What we need to do is add a check to make sure the left side has free variables before generating the expression. We'll fix that quickly enough. The way we are doing the conditional here is wrong, though, and Ghostlike blames it on his recent Python and JavaScript experiences affecting him adversely. We need to use a match statement here. In the real bottom-up segment of Spiral, the language has superpowers allowing it to match on types and terms without the type inferencer getting in its way. All of this is done at compile time and has zero overhead at runtime, much like in lineable functions. You can iterate over tuples as if they were lists, for example and the records are much more flexible in such a mode. You can map, fold, and iterate over the records. The symbol types are much more flexible, and you can pass different ones as arguments into functions rather than being constrained to a singleton. You can do a lot, 
and despite these powers, the language is in fact completely statically typed. It is just a different kind of static typing than the top-down one you are used to in any other language. Everything works, so let's end the video here. We'll do the folds and the reductions in the next one as an exercise. If you've found what I've been doing so far interesting, like and subscribe. Content creators of our caliber don't get paid, so we can only ask you to do that. Though HLS can do loop unrolling, it isn't capable of the generative feats that Spiral is, not without reaching for templates and all the attendant complexity of them. So the tree reductions we'll do in the next video should give you more insight into just what Spiral is capable of. The next video will go all over that, so please wait for it. We'll be back after the break.